We're a few minutes late. Sorry about that. It is, it's hard to believe. It's March 28th, last trading day of uh, the first quarter of 2024. I'm Tim Quast. With me is Brian Wilson, market strategist. And as is our custom, we will tag team uh, this discussion. Two rules, just mute yourself if you would during the discussion. And second, please ask questions. Feel free to interrupt us at any point. We each have a you know, set of items to cover. I've got I've technically got five things. I came up with another one, Brian, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> but they're kind, they all kind of blend together. I'm going to talk about mechanics mostly, and Brian has got probably bigger picture things to cover, and so and he's going to go first because I went first last week. So I will turn it over to you, Brian. Sounds good. Hi everyone. Hope you're doing well. Gr great to see everyone on the. Uh, on the call today, as Tim mentioned, we're coming up on uh, in, end of month and uh, end of quarter, which is uh, which is really hard to believe. Uh, I did have a couple of big picture items. Um, first item I was going to start with is actually a, a comparison between Nvidia and Apple, and I'll, I'll start with just a charting. And I'll show you how this is playing out when we look at uh, at Edge Info. Uh, so you're looking at uh, NVIDIA in blue. You're looking at Apple in red. Uh, this is a six-month chart. And you can see the dramatic difference between the two. I don't know uh, that I could have been as good as yeah, you were. On that. Uh, Dude, man. Uh, Apple's down would've. about 1%. Uh, uh, NVIDIA well, up you don't know. 100%. You don't know why you're here? Uh, yeah, during, exactly. During that time frame. And Tim, do you have that noise in the background? Exactly. Uh, if we look at it on a longer term basis, think of uh, oh, NVIDIA yeah, is right. up about 250%. No, I'm not swallowing uh, that shit. Apple, Apple up by about, uh, by about 7%. So there's a been a There you go. Here, I've got to unmute you, Brian. Hang on. Hold on. Uh, Brian, there you go. You are okay. You might have to unmute yourself. There you go. All right, we'll we'll okay, step back be, into it. Yeah. Uh, just just looking at uh, comparing Nvidia to Apple here at the beginning, there's been just a dramatic difference here over the last six months to a year. Uh, Apple's here in red, Nvidia in blue. Uh, this is a a one year chart. You can see Apple's up by about seven percent. Now, part of the reason that I bring this up is we we've had a tremendous AI surge. We're coming up to the end of a quarter. You know, what does this look like as we move into second quarter trading? Do we get this continued AI push uh, or do we get, let's call it a return to quality, if you want to call Apple kind of a quality stock? If you look at how this plays out from a market structure perspective, uh, it's an interesting look and you can see how uh, demand works in the marketplace uh, itself. So let's look at uh, NVIDIA. And this is the view that comes up automatically. You can take this view and you can tweak it however you'd like. Uh, let's bring it back to a one-year look. And you can see very, very clearly that NVIDIA is a momentum stock. Uh, look at the amount of time that it stays above five, quickly going to 10. If it goes below five, it quickly reverts back to 10. Just this rhythm moving you know, from one to 10, one to 10. Uh, now, look at what's happened here during the last uh, few months. It has not gone below five. I'd have to go and look, but that's uh, that's sometime in December. And you can see just the tremendous surge uh, in share price. So just tr a true momentum stock, any way you want to look at it. You can see short volumes have been moving lower over time. And I think this was actually in our momentum portfolio today. If, uh, if I recall cor uh, correctly, uh, take a look at that and compare this to Apple. And we'll take the same look at things here. Once again, on a, on a one year look, uh, look at the difference between the two. You can see that Apple started off well. This was last summer. You know, it was above five most of that time. Brief spurts up to 10, uh, went into the fall. Uh, spending a little bit more time below neutral. And then look, look what's happened here so far this year. 
share price has been moving lower and it's spent most of its time below neutral. Uh, so it's very difficult to post gains when you're not above neutral. Just two very diverse examples. One, you know, very much pegged to a momentum style. Uh, the other one that's just having difficulty uh, pick, picking back up again. Uh, right now, uh, NVIDIA 2.2 trillion market cap, Apple 2.6. So, you know, NVIDIA is truly catching up in terms of market cap. And we'll just see what happens here what, uh, in the start of the second quarter, whether that AI surge uh, continues. My second point today, I wanted to just give you a couple of examples. Tim's going to spend a little bit of time right here on the daily trading ideas. I, I trade one or two names from that list pretty much every day, but I'll let Tim speak into that. Uh, I did want to speak into other, let's call it styles of trading that you can do. There's many, many different ways that you can use uh, edge, edge info, and I'll just give you two examples here. Uh, one is more of a value uh, style play. I call it gaining momentum, and I'll show you what, what this looks like. I'm essentially looking at low volatility stocks, but I'm picking them up at the beginning. So they're moving between two and five. You can see some of the same care. It, it, it possesses many of the same characteristics as our low volatility portfolio. I'm just trying to pick them up a little bit earlier uh, in the ballgame. So if you like to do value investments, you can do something like uh, this portfolio. There's many different ways that you can you can set up these portfolios. Uh, let me give you one other example. Uh, similar example, I call it gaining momentum. Uh, and this one, in this particular case, is looking at stocks. Oops, I got the wrong one. Sorry about that. That's what, that's what we just looked at. Uh, I call it diverging liquid. It's uh, also a low volatility uh, portfolio. Uh, this, in this case, we're looking between five and, and eight. So it's taking on some of those momentum uh, characteristics. So if you like to trade momentum, but you don't want as much volatility in it, you could do something like this. This is the same criteria that we have in our low volatility portfolio. So it's picking out, uh, picking out stocks that don't have as much volatility. So if you don't want those huge moves in a given day, you can say, set something up like this, where it's picking up uh, those, those, once again, those low volatility uh, criteria. Uh, everything else, uh, I'll, I'll pick up one other idea here today. Uh, and then uh, my last point is kind of the what's ahead. And Tim and I can talk about that later. Uh, as we get to the end of the trading day, you might have some opportunities at day's end. Why I say that is because it's the end of the uh, end of the quarter, end of the month, and sometimes you get stocks for sale. And I'll just uh, pull up Carvana as uh, as an example. Um, I didn't pick up any news in the stock today. I don't know if I'm missing something. But if you, what I'm showing you here is that this is a low volume sell-off. Look at the average volumes. Look at today's volume. Uh, that hints to me that this is probably the machines taking them lower. That investors have just disappeared uh, at the end of the quarter. And I'll I'll take a look at this one towards the close. Maybe uh, maybe uh, pick up some shares. Maybe even pick up options on it. I'll have to do a little bit more homework. But my point in bringing this out is you might have some other examples as we get closer to the close today where maybe they're for sale just because it's month and quarter end. And it might be worth taking a look at uh, here during the next hour. And with that, I will stop sharing. OK, I guess it's my turn. Thank you very much, Brian, for that. Um, so my. Uh, general focus is to talk about the, the mechanics and specifics. And by that, I mean, I want to talk about the daily trading ideas. Glenn, uh, I'm going to, I will do that. I botched it last week. I tried to cover it. I'm not even sure what happened last week, but it was, a uh, you know, sometimes the magic works and sometimes it doesn't. By the way, speaking of magic, 
today was the magical last day of skiing for me in 2024. Uh, you know, I tried to get in 30 days and we have had just lovely conditions in Steamboat Springs. And we, we got, I would say, somewhere around 15 inches of fresh snow over the last couple of days here. And today was a beautiful bluebird groomer kind of day. So I hit, you know, it's, it's like that last day in, in the Tour de France when they're riding down the Champs Elysees uh, and they've got the champagne, you know, just before it gets serious. It was like that. So it, I'm, I'm going to miss the mountain uh, uh, till, till next season, but it was a great conclusion. Uh, so I hope this will be a great conclusion to Q1, uh, segueing. Let me get to mechanics. I'm going to share my screen and this, th th I will talk about daily trading ideas. Steve, you asked, uh, Steve Hicks, uh, author of the Hicks Rule, for those of you who are new, it's when stocks hit 10 and supply drops, high probability of good returns. We, we incorporated that into the momentum uh, portfolio. It's a core part of how we you know, crunched the data and looked at the probabilities. Uh, so I want to talk about the daily trading ideas, um, the, the mechanics of entries and exits uh, with some examples, uh, calculating the exit. I'll tell you what I do. And Steve, this was your question. You know, I, okay, the entry is pretty easy. Uh, what if you know, what if it's somewhere in that range, then how do you you uh, determine your your exit? And I've got several examples to, to illustrate uh, an answer, at least. And um, I, I want to talk about even the you know, market market orders versus limit orders and the size. And, and, you know, it's not I don't spend a lot of time thinking about this, but I do think about it because it can impact your returns. And I'll explain that. So I've got those things to cover, and that should lead us, believe it or not, that's four points in there. And then we'll, Brian and I will talk about what we what we see in the data. Uh, doesn't mean we're going to be right. You know, it's it's uh, uh, we have a lot of opinions about the market. John Cook, a lot of great data, and I, you know, to your point about some of the ways to improve uh, uh, the the time frames. I don't disagree with you. You know, the way I think about this from a business standpoint is. There, there, you know, the, there, are th there are things that we have to accomplish. Then we can invest more money in some refining uh, opportunities. There are refining opportunities. I don't, I don't disagree with you at all about that. Just for me, it, we, I have to be patient with that because there are a lot of other pieces of the puzzle that I'm, you know, working on behind the scenes. Okay, so let's get to daily trading ideas. Um, and if you haven't seen this before, this is what we have we have uh, launched. And I can't remember who Ben I think asked me. Well, what's the difference between the momentum and low volatility portfolios? And this is this really replacing these? Well, in a sense, yes. I mean, they're going to th these daily trading ideas. I'm going to click through are the momentum and low volatility portfolios. They will not perfectly match because we only include stocks that have at least a 50% calculated probability. I'll explain what that means here in just a moment. So in a sense, you know, as Ben said, he's like, well, why would you trade something that is doesn't have at least a 50% probability? Good, good question. Now, these are, you know, they're statistics only. There's no, there's no guarantee. It's not advice. We're just running math. You know, we're a quantitative uh, data provider. Uh, but these data have worked very well. Uh, so go, I want to cover this really quickly. Momentum is going to give you all of the stocks from the Momentum portfolio that have at least 50% probability of producing a 2% or more return uh, in the next trade day plus four days, five days. So we say one to five days. And it, 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 you know, the past performance is no guarantee of future outcomes. What we're doing is taking a 90 trading day period and calculating when, if, if a stock landed in the momentum portfolio, really that's what we're doing. That The momentum portfolio applies significant screening to give us large liquid lower risk securities that are all that all possess the same characteristics they have rising demand and falling supply or topped demand demand could peak and supply could diverge from it by falling those conditions still work there's just no question that that notion of diverging uh, supply and demand works very well 
converging supply and demand works very well to short the market. It's just been very challenging since October 31, really. <laughs> I've tried a couple of times, had to pull those. Uh, so you know, the time will come again when convergence will be much more potent than divergence. We're just not there yet. So in these portfolios, it's going to give you the ticker. And when you click through it, I'll do that in a second. It'll take you to the views. Uh, then it's going to give you the probability, uh, the last closing price, volatility, and it's default sorted by volatility, by the way. So it's going to give you the one with the highest volatility, not the highest probability. Because volatility is really important. I own Lyft. And I, you know, it's, I don't know how this is going to go. I bought quite a bit of, of Lyft in this range you know it was it i bought i think my entry point is around 1930 and it's like 1918 1920 right now prefer it not be but this it drives home the point of not trading price but probability what is occurring now will not tell you what occurs later supply and demand will do that even the machines machines are going to at this moment determine whether they will cross a spread to fill your trade, to buy or sell. And it will be predicated on everything that's occurring in the market. But what has occurred already and what may occur in the future is not the concern of the machines that are trying to be zero by day's end, if you follow. Citadel doesn't want to own anything at the close. Citadel doesn't want any exposure. They just want to be long and short throughout the day. At the end of the day, close their positions out and have a net profit. And they do that really well. Uh, well, that's helpful to us because they won't pay attention to the supply demand balances that are likely to skew the price a little later in the direction that we expect it to go. That's what we're using because we're not going to compete with Citadel. And notice that the market has a very difficult time rising or falling even 1%. It almost never rises or falls 2%. Why? Because of the prevailing behaviors in the marketplace. In index funds need 2% or less tracking error. For arbitragers who are trying to keep a basket of stocks and an ETF in line, they want 1%. Otherwise, it gets more challenging. So those things repeat over and over. And these volatility stocks, they're 3%. We cal calculate, we want at least 3% movement. Why? Because now you're a little outside the boundaries and those things may move more. And that's what we're after. Um, so we're going to, the momentum and low volatility are going to take those portfolios and show them to you. Things I like to do, I like to just go, okay, well, maybe I'm just going to sort by entry. You know, what's the lowest entry and why would I do that? I'm not saying that you have to do this all the time. By the way, if the regulators had their choice, all stocks would be $50 or less really between 20 and 50. If you look at the data in the SEC studies, you have to read thousands of pages. If you look at what the exchanges track in terms of market quality, they call it, all of those studies come back to the idea that the market functions really well for the regulators and the exchanges and Citadel if stocks are 20 to $50. Now, why? Well, because then you have very narrow spreads and not much volatility. That's what the regulators and the exchanges would like. Why? Because you don't want a market that destabilizes. If it does, things break. Uh, and, and the, you know, the market, you have to say, for, for the, the tremendous paucity of liquidity, it functions very well. So you can produce a return more quickly in a low price stock. There's no question. You know, if I buy, uh, I own 1,300 shares of Lyft. Well, it doesn't have to move much. You know, if I buy it at 1930 and you say, well, the exit's 1930, well, it depends where you are in this range. If I just want 2%, what is the probability I might get that? Well, it could do that in a minute. <laughs> to get, I could go all day down 1.5% and all of a sudden it's up, right? Because there's a lot of volatility in the market. It doesn't take much to skew the market one way or the other. Um, and so it's easier to do that in a stock in that range than it is in, say, you know, Arista Networks, where it's, you know, it's $285 stock, plus you can't buy much of it. So, to, you know, I'm not saying it's the only way to go by, by any means. I trade everything. It will depend on uh, what things look good. It's it, To your point, Brian, NVIDIA is in the momentum portfolio and Apple is in the low volatility portfolio. They are growth and value. The, the largest single category of investment on the planet is passive large cap blend. 
growth and value. Notice that the Russell 1000 growth stocks had outperformed value substantially by 9%. Now it's been cut in half. That they're only a 4% difference. And people will say, well, that's a broadening of the market. No, it's not. It's the consumption of the largest <laughs> asset category. A, a, there is no such thing, I'm sorry, as a broadening rally. There are only stocks that all the money owns and stocks the money doesn't own. And when you have to root around for more stuff to put in the basket because you're out of stuff, you know, there's not a single stock in the S&P 500 right now at a 52-week low. Everything has been pulled up, but it's by the it's because of the nature of ETFs dominating the market and all of them needing a basket of stocks. Those things are going to trade proportionately back and forth. And that has been largely consumed. You've run out of stuff for the basket. I don't know what we'll talk about what's coming based on all that stuff ahead. But it's important to understand that that's how the market works. Um, so the 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 thing to take away from this is. The entry point, Steve, to answer your question, and then calculating the exit. If I buy it at 1930, I want a 2% return. Well, you know, I don't have to look very, I could just say, well, I'm going to set my limit order at around 2021. I, you know, that whatever. I don't even need that much. It might be less than that because I know I'm in the range. And you say, well, what if it just continues to rise? Well, look at Evergy. Evergy is a great example of that. Um, if we go a stock that I bought and sold, and you you could if you relied on price, you say, well, it doesn't work. Uh, it worked very well, and I could have stayed in it, right? Because the point is, you just you want to take two percent. If you get more, fine. You don't have to leave. You can use demand and supply to tell you when. But for a number of days, it didn't do anything. Wham! It did. Now, how would we know that? Well, we can look at the supply demand balance, and. Other, you know, everybody isn't looking at that. We know that there's a very high probability, technically 100% probability, that if you bought it as I did, I think it was March 25th, that somewhere in the next one to five days, I'm going to get 2%. Well, son of a gun, I did. I was out skiing yesterday when my order filled up 2%. Right, well, I'm happy with that. Same thing with VZ, Verizon. You know, it's a, I just put in a, I know what the market is doing. I know the broad market demand and supply equation is very good. The probability that my, uh, you know, trade in Verizon is going to deliver a return in one to five days is very high. And sure enough, it did the same thing yesterday. I immediately filled while I was out skiing. I'm happy with that. It's higher. Do I, oh, I wish I'd stayed in. No, I don't care. I got what I wanted. Who cares? It's not like, well, I wish I'd stayed. No, you just look for the next thing. Uh, bringing this around to trades, a market order versus a limit order. You know, in a market order, you're taking the price that is offered. You know, that's what you're deciding to do. And the, the regulations say 100 shares or less uh, at the market must be filled at the best price. It is the law, and it's what permits market makers to create stock. So I could put, and I do periodically, I'm going to always look at what's at the bid and the ask. What is the, how, how much volume is at the bid and the ask, knowing that half of it is fake, half of it is not real. It's coming from Citadel at all, who are manufacturing orders to, to get people to put orders into the market so they can split them up and take a tenth of a penny. That's how they make money. Well, I know that. Um, so I know if I put in several thousand shares at the market, even if there are several thousand shares available, that the probability I harm my own interest is high. Why? Because Citadel will have to fill a portion of that trade with stock they created. Now they want to be short it. So I may lose some performance and it may stretch me out a day or two to get my return. I you should just know it. That's all. And do I think about it very often? Not very often. I mean, if there are if I, there are 200 shares at the bid and the offer, I'm going to buy them 99 shares at a time if it's a penny spread. Why? Because I know I'm not increasing the liquidity in the market with my trade. I'm taking what they have to give me. If I can do that 99, 99, 99, 99, I'm probably enhancing my cap capability to produce a return in a shorter period of time. Don't have to overthink that. It's just something to know. That's why we put dollars per trade. Uh, as a metric. So you can see what is the real amount that you can buy. And it may be three or $4,000 of stock uh, before the price changes, less than that in Lyft. So those, those things all come together 
uh, around how to use these data effectively. I don't even think about it much. I really like our daily trading ideas because I don't really even look around. I sort it by entry. I look at the stuff that's, oh, it's 100%. Okay, I'm going to trade that. I go, look, is it between 26.84 and 27.59? I'm buying it, right? All other things being equal. And then I don't even have to worry about it. And I do that with a couple of stocks, and that's what I do. And it works very well. I did that with Evergy, Verizon, Energy, last N NRG ticker. I just do it over and over, and it works very effectively. Uh, is it exciting? I don't know if it's exciting, but it's certainly not stressful to do that. Now, what you have to be aware of to, to bring this around to conclusion, and I can answer questions, is what is occurring, as, as Brian said in his market desk note today, beware of broad sentiment, context, and then divergence or convergence. That comes last. So what's broad sentiment doing? And Brian, we can start talking about what's going to occur. You can look at what's happening in the broad market. You know, demand has bottomed and is rising and supply has plunged from 51 to 49 and a half. That's a big drop. I like to go look at SPY to see if it's doing the opposite because that's the hedge. You know, is the hedge the opposite? Well, it sure is. Demand is at five and supply is rising. Those things cancel each other out. This is the ETF in the basket. It's the way the market works. So people are going to be long the basket right now but they're hedged with the ETF. What does that set up ahead? I don't know. These are still very low, uh, but that's I look at those things. Then what is the context? Well, you can go you know, look at uh, market structure edge at the, the uh, calendar here. It's very important. And this is, you know, you, you, you already know this if you veterans do. So tomorrow's Good Friday, market's closed. Uh, and, it's the last trading day of the month. That circle points to month end options expirations. They're principally S&P 500 instruments, but that's most of the market cap. I mean, it's astonishing how much market cap is concentrated in it. By the way, Q1 last year, 2023, passive investment was 21% of the volume of the average component of the S&P 500. It is now 26%. That's a 20% increase. Stock picking has not increased. So you can't say it's because, wow, everybody's enthused about stocks. No, the market is going up because passive money gets larger and larger and larger and needs more and more and more of a shrinking set of goods. More money, more companies are leaving the market than are coming into it via IPO. There are more deals, M&A, that takes stocks out of the market. I mean, we see them every day. We're running this data. We're seeing every day who gets delisted. Uh, Fisker just got delisted. Who gets bought? And we lose three or four a week at least. Well, there aren't IPOs keeping up with that. What's going to happen? Well, more and more money has got to consume the same goods. And it's money following a model. It's not money buying fundamentals. It's BlackRock saying, well, in all of these managed, managed accounts or all these ETFs, we're following a model that says we need 26% of the equity market. Okay, well, they're going to go consume the same products that everybody else is. So that's the thing that you have to be aware of. I think Brian is right. I don't love the notion of being in a position over this long weekend. I hope I don't have to be. Um, you know, what would cause me to have to be if I feel like I need to stay in because I'm underwater and I think I might make, you know, might make money on a position. Otherwise, it would be wise to sit out. You know, you can always do something come Monday. Uh, uh, to, yeah, Monday. So, Brian, weigh in. Yeah, thank you. I'll I'll turn it over to Steve for a second. Uh, he had a question. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Tim, when you take off and go skiing, when you set your price for sale, yep, are, you're doing a stop limit on that, aren't you? I am. Yep. Okay. Because I can't watch it. Yeah. I right. don't. Okay. I, I actually see. don't set. I don't put a stop on it. Which you know, you say, well, what kind of chance are you taking? I have so much confidence that the demand supply equation is superior, that I will do that. Because here's the problem. I, 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 won't, I don't want to chew up much time, but I do want to answer this. I read an article this morning. It was in Forefront Communications. I kind of follow their stuff. It's very good on markets. And they were talking about this, this profusion of algorithms that is hitting dark, dark liquidity. Dark liquidity simply means it's not displayed. Look, the exchanges have it. They'll pay you 15 cents a hundred to hide liquidity that is not being displayed. Well, those algorithms are what are taking out my stops. 
because they go through, they break up orders and they go, whoop, and they're sweeping through the prices and there goes my, then I get stopped out. So if I feel that the supply demand equation is in my favor and I'm willing to risk 1%, I don't even put one in. So I put a limit, but no stop. And I bo- I got limited out of both of those positions yesterday. Exactly what I was after, right? That's what I want. Uh, Tim, one, one question from Jeannie. Uh, she's asking whether we will be able to export the daily trading ideas to Excel. Uh, you, you actually, oh, good point, Jeannie. And well, I don't, Jeannie, I think you're new. Well, thank you for being here. Yeah, it's, John wants that too. There. And people want the broad sentiment data exportable. So as soon as I'm comfortable that we've got the interactive brokers data, uh, you know, and we had a bunch of stuff overnight. Uh, the engineer was working until midnight on a couple of things. So I would say, Jeannie, it's our aim because we make it available with the momentum and low volatility portfolio. So why wouldn't we in those? Absolutely. Just give, give us a little bit to iron out all the wrinkles. You betcha. Thank you. What else we got? Uh, that's it we, for the questions. If you're okay, to, or, go ahead, Steve. Yeah. Well, I, just one more question. Yeah. When uh, the market starts to turn, which I am very convinced it's going to, especially after the news coming out today about Buffett and uh, his his whole strategy is to get out at this point. I, I mean, that has huge publicity. <laughs> so, uh <laughs> Will this, will you be able to do this uh, same momentum uh, for trades uh, like what you have right now uh, going short or is that going to be looked upon by the, uh, our brothers, the SEC is (laughs) not so good? I, you know, I don't know. It depends on how severe it gets. You'll recall that in 2007, the SEC did away with the uptick rule. So, yeah. you know, they thought, well, this is a, this is not necessary. Then we had the immediately had the financial crisis, and a and people were outraged. So they had to implement a modified uptick rule with gird. They prefer that. They like those girders around things. Whatever. I don't think they work. Uh, but that's what they have chosen. They could ch- sure they could change the rules, uh, but they they have a very difficult time doing it, and it tends to be years after the fact. They didn't implement Reg a- SHO Rule 201 till 2011. They formalized it in 2010. So we're way past the financial crisis before they address it. So we'll find out. You know, it to me what, what how I think about this is when we can trade supply and demand effectively in individual securities or the under the related options as brian does we do that when the market deteriorates right now the data don't show it it can change in a heartbeat i'm very interested to see what happens in q2 i look at the data now and say it's fine uh but it has a value ba- bias clearly it has a low volatility bias when it changes i will short the market i like to use leveraged etfs long and short but only when there is a clear supply demand divergence or convergence because they you'll get you can get your behind handed to you otherwise that's my thinking i don't know if i've answered that your question steve actually what i was wanting to find out you know how you have your daily recommendations yep your new your new thing that you just put up will yep. that will you reverse that uh, at some point in time when we start seeing momentum going down instead of up. It's a great point. What will happen is we'll run out of components in the momentum portfolio. You're right. right. I don't, I don't know. It's a great question. And, and it wouldn't be that hard. We could take the, the Norton rule and, and invert <laughs> the momentum <laughs> portfolio and display it. We could do that. I'll, t- I'll make a note of it. You know, I hadn't really thought about that because it will, that will come around. We will have another 2022. <laughs> Tim, okay, gonna, Brian. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Was, could you show prop, like, could we just see that probability number across every stock? I mean, I understand why you guys are filtering it, but that'd be a great, you know, I don't know yeah. why that isn't in the menu, basically. It, it is the 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 challenge is the challenge is that data changes and uh, how does it help you is the question if you if you don't first have a set of criteria that tell you 
here's where there's the best mathematical probability, then does telling somebody there's a probability of 25% mean anything? I get it. And we would like it. We talked about it a lot internally. I mean, Interactive Brokers wants us to do that. You know, like, well, give us every stock and all these probabilities. And we said, that's our intellectual property. <laughs> so, you know. Well, no, I mean, I, yeah. I, I just, I'm saying like, you know, here's an example. Say you want to buy XLE underperformed in January, overperformed. I'd love to see yep. build a portfolio of XLE and then have the probability of, okay, well, here are the next, you hear the best ones to start with, right? Because I could overweight yep. to them, you know, things like that. So that'd that's be like one example. No, as a very, it's, it's, it's irrefutable that it's a good idea. So it, 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 is, it is in our development calendar to see how, how we'd have to run it all and then test it, you know, and, and, uh, but I get you, I do. All right. Any so here's what I I will say. Thirty seconds. What I see in the data and Brian, you finish it. Uh, as we you know, so we cross over quarter end here. We were talking about the colossal collapse in short volume in SPY and what that would mean. And and I think it meant that there's a shift in the way that the market is hedged. There's clearly a bunch of consumption of low volatility stocks. You can see that in the Dow's performance yesterday. The Dow's up 480 points. It is not because of enthusiasm of, in, of, for industrials. It is because low volatility stocks are in the basket at the end of the quarter that everybody's buying or that they've got to have options or futures on to true up tracking. That's where the money went. Now, what happens in Q2? Well, you look at the supply demand divergence and say, well, we're setting up fine. But I'm, you know, I... I am skeptical too. I am very wary that we have got, we have had such a tremendous uh, period of excess buying in equities that when it stops, it could be violent. Hasn't yet. Brian, what mm -hmm. do you think? Yeah, my, my look, uh, I, I'm, I'm saying good, but conflicting. Uh, you know, we look at the broad market, it has divergence, which is fantastic. It's exactly what you want to see. Uh, we look at SPY. Good. Uh, short volumes are low, but that signal is now weakening. Uh, here's the opposite. My short portfolio only has one component right now. So there's right. there's nothing to short right now. Yep. But the other side of that is the Magnificent Seven is stumbling into quarter in. So you have these just series of conflicting data points. Uh, it overall is it, it, good. You know, we're above five. Uh, sentiment continues to rise. I don't think this market is going to fall apart. Uh, I think if we do have a pocket of weakness, that it's probably going to be pretty short. So that's kind of what I see for the early part of next week, at least. Well said. Good note to conclude on.